I'm Shalina Tobin, aka Posh Nosh Gal, and today I'm joined by the Michelin starred chef Brad Carter. Brad's culinary journey has taken him across Europe, refining and developing his own style of innovative modern British cuisine. Brad's now brought this style back to his hometown of Birmingham in the form of the wonderful Carters of Mosley restaurant, which he's run for the last decade. Hi, Brad. How are you doing? Hi, yeah. Uh, I'm good, thanks. See you. Yeah, really good, thank you. And um, while I know many have enjoyed lockdown time, you've actually been working really hard through it. Tell, tell me about what you've been doing. Yeah, uh, no, no rest for us. It's been uh, it's been full, full on since uh, the close down, really. So we've been uh, we turned the business into uh, uh, an online shop. So we went to home deliveries. Uh, so the the concept was uh, it took us two days to build it as a team effort. So we went down to our core four. Uh, so it's me, my partner Holly, uh, Alex, the GM, and then uh, Peter, my right hand man, who's uh, in the kitchen with me. Uh, since day one. So we built an online shop doing uh, delivered hampers. So the hampers uh, consist of a cooked meal to eat and then a raw meal on the top. So a little bit of uh, a delivered meal and then a little bit of fun with after to cook you, yourself with our produce. Uh, there's a few uh, factors that, uh, that what made us want to do that. And it was uh, it was mainly to keep, to keep ourselves, you know, keep ourselves here uh and then secondary to keep the supply chain there because the ethos of the restaurant is is completely about ingredients suppliers Absolutely. and it's took me a long long time to build that up over the years and uh, i just had this really bad feeling that if we lose the supplier the suppliers and the supply chain to the restaurant then we don't have the restaurant anymore let alone whether i'm here or not yeah, so absolutely. for me to keep them going, uh, at one point uh, at the start, I think we were the only people doing it, and uh, we were the only people in the UK ordering produce, uh, and that made me feel good. Uh, although it was very hard, it made me feel good that it was a good thing that we did for them, and uh, yeah, I think it's made our relationship even stronger. I think uh, moving forward when we open back up, obviously I'll be the golden boy now. I think. So. <laughs> well. Your suppliers must be very happy with you. So, so well done for keeping the supply chain going. And so, what are the logistics of setting up a delivery company? You literally set it up overnight. What I mean, what yeah. are the things that you had to go through? Uh, so it was it was very challenging, uh, very different to the normal day to day pressure. Uh, obviously, working in the restaurant for so long now, you you get used to that pressure, and then you find another project to keep yourself occupied and the, the food and the restaurant is built around a team that make it happen whereas this was like back to basics having to learn everything from scratch uh i obviously i'm not the best on computers uh, alex is good on computers uh but i can cook so we built an online shop uh with the help from the web designers and then uh we holly uh got the whole cellar out and tried to sell every bottle of wine we had in stock oh brilliant <laughs> and then uh, we basically um, uh, decided what we we're going to do concept wise and then just kind of sort of learn along the way. The, the most challenging thing with really it has been uh, constantly having to innovate and keep people hooked. Uh, we've, we do that in the restaurant anyway, but some dishes take so long to get, to get perfect, in, in my opinion, uh, over months and months of developing you know, an ice cream mouthfeel texture. And then all of a sudden we're having to think of a new product, you know, almost every day to keep people buying and interested and, and yeah. uh, linked to the restaurant. So that was challenging. That's like, time consuming. Uh, and then the, the other challenges was national delivery. So obviously we normally put something kind of a plate, send it to a table and then see someone's reaction instantly. And, and that's what we live for. We live for that customer engagement that was taken away. So putting something in a box, giving it to a courier and then hoping for the best kind of things hard, hard to, to sort of deal with and, and understand. And, um, it, you know, that was a lot to learn and hoping it was going to get there for one. And uh, because it's not a lot you can do when you put it in a box and send it, that's it. So yeah. we find that challenging. Uh, but at the same time, we've had a lot of really good feedback. Uh, customers have really enjoyed it. 
a lot of good stuff on the internet. So we put on the bottom of the, the menus, uh, so we put a sheet in the box explaining the method and what to do and how to eat it and how to cook it. And then at the bottom we say share your stories and stuff. So everyone's been sort of jumping on the internet and showing us their cook, uh, their cooking and their, their results. And that's oh, been amazing. nice. Yeah, yeah, it's been nice. So although it's it's still food that you've kind of transformed your, your business into, but it's a very yeah. different way of, of operating. Is it something that you think you'll continue with once you actually open up? I think uh, here in this site, no. Uh, I would never say never again. Uh, but when we turn back into a restaurant, which we do open on the 2nd of September, uh, oh. we won't be able to do the two things in this, this, this location, uh, obviously. Uh, having that kind of set up is oh, at the moment we've literally got no towels and chairs in here or anything so we're just like uh, you know assembling boxes in a production line and then sort of filling them up so to do that at the same time it's just not possible in this location but it would be it could be an option elsewhere or somewhere else or you know fingers crossed we don't this doesn't happen again and and you know we have to go back to it but it would be a case of just keep changing uh, the location yeah. until we open something else uh, the, the challenge and the fun side of it, obviously, now we've learned it, it would be very simple to flip straight back to it uh, because we know what we're doing uh, and we put all the hard work in as a team. But uh, at the same time, I don't, I don't want to go back. I want to get back in the restaurant. To be honest. Keep looking forward. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's yeah. an amazing backup plan. I think what you've done in such a short span of time is, is absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I think with a lot of our peers and, and uh, you know, and the restaurants and my chef friends have all uh, credited us for that. And, yeah. Uh, whereas I think, you know, obviously it's quite nerve wracking for the public and, and whatnot. And we had a conversation between us because we're like family anyway. We're all prepared to do it. We're all prepared to, for the challenge and to do it together. Um, and that's what it take, took really. If, if Alex or Peter would have said, I don't feel like doing it, it's not for me, when we might have had to go another way. But obviously, we all supported each other to, to do it. And, and uh, I think the customers really liked the fact that we just kept our brand in the limelight and, and, and they've been talking about that a lot. You know, like you, you haven't seen us go away really, uh, which is for me really important. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let, let's just talk about your journey, Brad. You fell in love with cooking when you, I mean, you entered a pizza competition at the age of 11. So how long were you spinning pizzas to be good enough to enter a competition? Uh. Well, I'm actually a lot better than, now than it was then. Uh, <laughs> I, um, food for me was started with, uh, I, I've always been, my mum always cooked when I was young. And then um, obviously we had a lot of trouble with, with dad and stuff at home. And then obviously when he went away, it was very much work. You know, my mum worked a lot of hours and a lot of three jobs. So I'd come home and I'd go out all night because I was a bit naughty. But um, I used to... Um, I used to make sure she got fed once a day and it was, I mean, it was pretty basic. It was on toast and all that kind of stuff, but it was something that I made sure I did. And it was like a routine thing. And I wanted to, I wanted to make sure at least she got something and then I'll go and she wouldn't even see me. She'd just eat it. Oh, uh, so it, it came from that really. And I just enjoyed the satisfaction of doing it and putting it together. And, and it's just something that I like doing because I didn't really learn very well at school, like facing a blackboard at the time, what to do. I like to learn sort of my own way and creative and use my hands and stuff. Right. And uh, then I basically, I, I chose uh, food, it was called food technology and then that is, I don't know why, but it was called that. And then yeah, I, I chose that and none of my friends uh, did it uh, and I did it. And then obviously there was a little pizza thing and I did it and I won. But that was like, uh, that's, pretty, that's, that's like one of my most talked about awards. And it was like when I was like 13 or 14 or something, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So man. But uh that was uh that was just something that I think rather than being madly interested in cooking all the time, it's just something I, I was obviously just good at. So I just did it and it came out better than everyone else's. Uh and then it sort of then it sort of dropped off and then I, I started at um a local pub where I live, just uh literally working in uh um, as a kitchen porter. So I just didn't really know where I was going and whatnot. So I took the job as a kitchen porter and that was, uh, that was a, I really enjoyed it. And then about six or seven months later, I sort of moved over to bit, done a bit of cooking as well. It was pretty simple stuff and most of it was frozen. Uh, did that. And then one of the chefs there was like, you should, uh, 
you should go to college. Uh, and I was really nervous because I didn't I really did a lot of school and it's uh, not something I wanted to do. And I went back uh, to, to college and I thought this is going to be really bad and hard and actually I really enjoyed it. Uh, I wasn't the star of the show or the, the, t the top, top boy in the class, but I was, I definitely enjoyed it and I finished the course and everything. And then from oh, there okay. I went to live in. Uh, I went to live in Menorca in Spain, so a small island near the beef and the Blairics. Uh, and I worked in a little family run restaurant there. So I worked there for nearly two years. And that was being away from home, you know, like having, having fun, but working really hard. And yeah. first, got a real job as a chef, really. Um, and then. And why did you choose that, that location? Uh, I got offered it at the end of college. So when I finished, uh, they were talking about what, what I was going to do and, and if I had a plan because they do that with the students and I, my, my first choice was to go to London that's what I wanted to do uh, just yeah. about, so I've always been really mad on cities and uh, I just thought it was it, there was not in my day in Birmingham like they were talking like 20, 20 years ago there wasn't as many restaurants as there are now that were worth working at so if you were going to take your job really seriously uh, it was kind of like a restaurant wasteland you know there's there's probably two that were worth eating at that are high end right. and then not a lot not a casual market at all so there's all sort of pub chains and stuff like that so the natural thing is to go to college and then use it as a stepping stone to move on to something else but yeah of course uh I, I don't know I think I um I always thought I'd be better in in my hometown I don't know and I, I went to Spain and I, I came back and and, and thought got into my head I wanted to sort of focus more on my uh, skills set rather than working for anyone kind of not well known or famous like some of the best chefs now that I know uh, that are actually people that I looked up to because you know that's that's gonna happen because I've never worked in that sort of circle um, and then I um yeah I thought I to get to, to jobs that were going to help my skill set and, and my speed so I worked in a hotel for a little while after Spain which was uh, because I knew I was quite, quite slow and I knew that if I worked in a hotel as breakfast, lunch, dinner, the, the pace was going to get, uh, you know, picked up and I was I was uh, under a lot more pressure but actually it was a, like a low position so it was good to get my head down but I'd done really well and progressed quite quick. Back in Spain it was run by a, uh, a couple from Solihull near Birmingham so oh, couple, uh, yeah yeah so i just moved straight into a, a beautiful location with all but brummies basically oh, wow. <laughs> and uh the, re the the little restaurant itself was a uh, it was a, like a really nice setting so it's like in a lemon tree garden so it was like half half was inside half was outside with a lemon tree and it's yeah pretty special and uh, but, you yeah, have after that, do you have any interesting short stories that, that you can share from from that time uh yeah a few of them are probably a bit x-rated from the after parties <laughs> and stuff like that but uh the uh yeah we used to cook for um, a lot of sort of well-known famous people there because they had holiday homes so um we, we had um john barnes used to play for liverpool in england he came like every other night for like two about two or three weeks right uh, we got to know him and then uh, we had uh, Michael Paley in the Explorer. He came and uh, he was really nice. He came like every other night. Um, that, were, that was a lot of fun. It was like cooking, and then we got to sit down with them afterwards and like, have a laugh and a joke and whatnot. And then uh, one, one amazing story we, uh, there was a really wealthy customer, in, but we didn't know it at the time. He was chatting to us and he said, Oh, you should come to my, uh, I'm having a party on a boat. Uh, uh, on Sunday in your off, so you should come. So we're like, oh, that'd be good. So me and my, my pal are like, we're like 18, so we're dressed like 18 year olds. And uh, we head down to the port to this boat, and it's like a 10 million pound yacht. Wow. It's huge, right? And we got there, there's a butler and a doorman. And we were like, we thought it was just a little boat in our head, like a <laughs> tiny little rowing boat. And uh, we got there, and he let, he let us on. And he was guys like really nice. So she's like, oh, can I have some drinks? And there was lobsters going around. And we were like, we literally didn't feel like we should have been on there. But we, he was such a nice customer. He just wanted to give us a bit back. Oh. And uh, that was cool. And then that, that's when you, you kind of get the customer engagement. And you know that 
you know, if you're good to them, they're good to you, and, and, and that helps you set you up in your own uh, uh, your restaurant and whatnot. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And so you opened up Carters of Mosley in 2010, and you received your yeah. first Michelin star in 2015. Is that something that that you were aiming for, or, or was it completely unexpected? No, uh, for me, I, I, obviously, I've never worked in one, so yeah. I've never worked for a, a chef who's it, is sort of in, at that level or in a kitchen like that. Um, it was weird. It was like uh, I, I thought it was a bit of a joke at first. I couldn't get my head around it, but obviously, what I realised now is because it was so focused, what we were doing, like we opened the restaurants, and me and Holly wanted a small place to refine what we did. So the, we'd done the pubs that were really good, like you know, high value, really fresh food, like really, really good stuff. We'd done all of that and we felt like we needed something that pushed us a little bit more. So the idea of getting a small restaurant in recession was a crazy idea, really. But, uh, and we were quite young, but at the same time, we thought this is our chance and we're going to do it. And we've always been workers. We work really well together. Uh, and then uh, it was just really small scale at the, at the time. It was like three or four of us. And uh, we're just so focused. And the, the, I always say, like, the longer you're in a, a place doing one thing over and over again, the better you're going to get at it. And it's kind of the way it's gone here. So, uh, yeah, I've sort of like the, the thing that made us more nationally exposed was we won a uh, Good Food Guide Restaurant of the Year in 2013. And that was that's when people started to notice what we were doing. And it was all down to business. So we opened it. Uh, focused it to, to be a, res a restaurant that, that we could live and work in, you know, and, and work for ourselves. Uh, and the restaurant, we at that point, we decided to, we, we worked out that if we took 45 to 50 pound a head per guest, we, we'd be okay. So we changed the menu to a set menu for that reason. Um, and when we did that, immediately, uh, it was a lot more secure as a restaurant. And uh, the people started to notice because it was a set menu. So then the guides were looking at it a little bit more, thinking, oh, it's got a bit of a style going on and whatnot, I think. And then obviously they started to come. And then obviously winning that was more national exposure made us a lot busier. And then uh, obviously 15 got a star before the, uh, before the Swanky Awards. So it was a phone call and uh, in the kitchen kind of thing. But um, yeah, it's pretty surreal because obviously I've been in that circle. Uh, the first Michelin inspector I ever met in my restaurant it was the first one I ever met face to face, uh, and yeah, it's quite weird. It's quite weird because a lot of my chef mates they're so driven by that, and they work in these restaurants, and they that's all they want. That's, they work, 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 and they, you know, for me, it's kind of been like, oh, that's it's like being in a, an Oscar. You know, it's it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I, I think what uh, the restaurant having it is is the best thing ever, but yeah, it wasn't my, the reason I opened it. Um, yeah. And that's, okay. that's cool because it's, it's a nice thing to, to sort of you know, add on to what we do and, and we're all really proud of that. Absolutely. I mean, it's amazing that you've accomplished that on your own. You haven't had any experience with other Michelin star chefs. You've, you've literally, that's just off your own back. So yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. Who are the, who are the chefs that inspire you that, that you, know, you draw inspiration from? Actually, when I was, young, I, when I was younger, I used to love Gary Rhodes. And like, like when I was like growing up through there, so when I was in a, a small place that I would run with Holly and where I first met, her, uh, I used to basically decide to put something on the menu and then learn how to cook it, basically, because I didn't know, I didn't know how to cook it. Um, and he was like my main, because I was, had this British thing running through me since day one. So I've always been Mr. British. I've always liked everything British. Uh, and it's like over the years, I've just refined and refined and refined that uh, to where we are now. But Gary Rhodes for me, he was, he was a, in his day, like in you know the early 2000s, he was a pioneer of that. that. And he, he's basically got a Michelin star cooking bread and butter pudding. Now that's like an achievement in itself. And he made it all very current again and, and exciting. And uh, I just remember always going to that book and thinking that it was, it was really, really exciting to, to, to read it and learn about the recipes. And, uh, I still cook the haddock rabbit now. I think that's like a genius invention. I just, I just oh. wish I'd have thought of it. That's the dish I wish I'd have thought of. Uh, <laughs> do you, do you but, serve it in your restaurant? 
No, no, no. I wouldn't. I wouldn't replicate anything in the restaurant. I think uh, unless you know someone personally or you've worked for them, I think that's a that's a nice thing to do. But for me, it's all, all got to be from, from the from in here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And so how, I mean, where do you get the inspiration from to create your own dishes? Do you, do you work from the way it looks? I mean, obviously it's seasonal, but is, is the way it looks important to you or is it more about the taste? Yeah, I think uh, overall, like it's flavour uh, always. And then we work back from that. So we look at, because it's very specific, not the same we do. Uh, we don't use uh, many imported ingredients at all, just almost down to chocolate and coffee now important so whereas we'd normally just you know if you can want a sit of tea grab a lemon and then you add lemon and that's how it's done and the sauce is finished but with us we don't use them so we have to think a lot more uh so it kind of pushed us into a corner and made it very very more challenging and a lot more difficult but it's actually made us far more creative because for that little bit of pain thinking and, and getting it to, to the plate and getting it right is actually made us unique right and uh that's what I really I get off, I buzz off that, get off on that. It's like hard for me. Sometimes you get writer's block and you're trying to think of something, but it's always about the taste. So like we're like, we'll find something that we really like and then we're like, right, oh, this reminds me of this. Okay, and then we start thinking about uh, something like that's really classic and then we're like, oh, we can use that and do it in our own style. Right. And the, the presentation and everything is very minimalistic. So we like the product to, sh to shine. So then uh, the look of it is always down to like, we try and bring it from the its natural habitat to the table. So there's a lot of thought that goes behind that part of it. And actually, uh, a lot of the things that I think about the most are um, sort of the main feel and the delivery. So if, if you take a duck, for instance, what do, I always ask myself the things I like most about duck. So it's the fat, uh, the flavour of the meat, the, uh, the, the crispiness of the skin, all of these factors. So then I work my ass up trying to create the best skin the best deep flavor and then, then i highlight the things that i really like about eating them myself and then I, I work really hard on the technique so the technique is and the supply is far more important than the plate the look of it and everything like that that comes second got it and and you've mentioned holly quite a few times so she works yeah. front of house and provides the dining yeah. experience while you create the magic yeah. in the kitchen how yeah. is it for you in that working in that husband and wife sort of dynamic yeah it's uh it's yeah i mean it's sometimes it's you know i i'll, I'll have a little moan and she just ignore me that's i think that's the way to work <laughs> so long but what happens uh, if you strongly disagree on something who who usually uh, makes argument so years ago when we were younger, uh, obviously we worked together for a while before we actually got together. So it was, it, for us, it was, we, we knew, we, it was just natural. It just felt like I'd been working with her for a long time. So we really got the work thing. And then we, uh, I'm only where I am because of the support she gives me to, to you know, I'm crazy, I'll come in and I want to do a million things at once. And she's just like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then, you know, I need that because I need someone to be able to just, sweep up the army kind of thing and, and make everything work work well uh she's obviously got a natural ability with guests so she's like uh what she does with with people is her thing it's, and people love coming in to see her so like a lot of guests love the food but they actually prefer just to come and have a drink and meet her that, that's that's one of the factors we have but over the years obviously you get quite shady and like you know there's a bit of bit of tension but uh, we learn how to deal with it refine it and we try to we kind of keep it to like meetings so we keep work work and then try and separate uh, i think that's really important i think you need to know what's work and what's not yeah uh, absolutely and and i think that sort of dynamic works really well because i mean no one's going to care about your business as much as you two right so yeah so, you know working as a team is it's so important but you know it's it, that actually, it actually goes further with us because uh my my right hand peter is my sous chef it's actually holly's brother as well uh but we, we we employed him for his skills uh as a chef but actually having the, that depth of family through the business and then alex is basically like adopted family now oh amazing so, like, like so for us it's solid because the four of us and then the other people that work here bolt on and actually a lot of the staff come here like it's not about we don't look at cbs we 
you know, they're not the most important thing. We hire per personalities and people who really want to work here and, and live this lifestyle because the restaurant is so, uh, it's, we try and, we, we live the way we work. So like, you know, the customer, we only eat the, the food the customer would eat. There's no secrets, you know, we only, we, everything we give to them is the way that we, we live at home. And like everyone who works here actually is the same and they get that. It's a big part of working here. Really. It's not all, all about just, oh, I want to go there to earn money and learn off this chef and then off I go. It's, yeah, it's all about passion. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And so, um, wow, family affair. I think that's awesome. Is there, <laughs> um, what's your worst kitchen disaster story? Have you got any encounters with your brother-in-law? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've had a, we had a couple of, uh, we used to call them the rock and roll days when, it, when there's just the two of us in the kitchen. Uh, that were hard, you know, long, long, long. Uh, actually, one of the one of the hardest things here was uh, the first Christmas. We didn't know the market, didn't know how busy we were going to be, and actually, we uh, we committed to open Christmas Day, which we do every year, to in the suburbs, and uh, it's a really good day for us for customers. Money was, but um, we the first Christmas we did a new Christmas Eve, and we were absolutely packed. I mean, we were flat out. We didn't stuff and we didn't expect to be that busy but we hadn't done any sort of prep for Christmas day and we committed to doing beef wellingtons like individual ones for every person that was coming in on Christmas day it's about 40 guests and that's a lot of work so we started then after service so that's like 1am and uh, I literally didn't sleep like we're literally doing beef wellingtons all through the night by hand individually and uh, took till about 6.37 and then I thought I've got to get an hour's sleep and I, I used to live upstairs so I basically went up for an hour's sleep and then my, one of my friends from school he was still in touch with he's a fireman so he was coming home from work at eight and he woke me up to say happy Christmas but I literally had an hour's sleep right. and, uh, that was uh that was the good old days when we were like we didn't know what was what was going on <laughs> working 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 or sleeping in the kitchen yeah I can't oh wow that. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Change so, a little bit now, though. Get, some, get a little few more hours sleep now. Yeah, yeah, of course. Very important. <laughs> <laughs> it's a stressful environment in the kitchen. So, yeah, you've got to have your sleep. Actually, um, that's a big thing that has. We, we keep we try and keep it stress free. We're very focused on service. It's all about customers. Uh, but there's no shame. There's none of that. I haven't been taught that way. It's like for me, shouting for me is negative. So, at school, at home, all of that. I just turn off and it's not for me. And I think the, the people would do the same right. if I was doing it to them. They wouldn't, they'd turn around and there's none of that. And actually, I, we haven't got a wall in the kitchen. It's completely open. The dining room is, is the kitchen. So it's cool. it's uh, important that we just look like we're having a good time. You know, that's yeah. at the end of the day, it's a precious time for the guests to come here on their lunch or dinner off. And we want to, welcome them and, and make them have the best time like because we're having a good time yeah of course of course so just one last question for you it's been amazing chatting with you just one last thing which is tell me something about yourself that i couldn't possibly know <laughs> so a few people know it now but I, when i was uh growing up as a chef i used to work in the underground rave scene so i used to do like, dj and mc with my friends oh that's cool and, uh, i started to get really good at it because it's something that I grew up with from, from the not mid 90s when I was at school and then I just carried it on and uh, it's yeah it's, I've tried to integrate it into my uh, restaurant and, and whatnot at the moment uh, it's challenging because it's very different to nature right. <laughs> but right. it's uh, I think my personality is definitely starting to shine through here now and I think that's something that I really love and I still like and 160 beats per minute and I still Every time I get a chance, I play. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. You could always record your own music and play it in the restaurant. Or you know. That is the dream. That is the dream. I don't know whether every customer would like it, but that is the dream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be a little softer, more muted for the restaurant. And then, you know, in the kitchen, it could just be really wild to get you guys going. Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pre-service uh, pre service action, that is. Yeah, get, get them all pumped up before we start. Absolutely. Um, so it's been amazing chatting with you, Brad. Thank you so much for your time. Guys, if you, you want to follow Brad on Instagram, he's at Chef Brad Carter, and I'm at Posh Nosh Gal. Thank you so much, Brad. Take care. Uh, thanks.